leadership in organizational change. Today's topic on uncommon sense. I'm Joshua Barnes. I am the founder of Process Ventures. And as usual, I am joined by Steve Tendon and Al Shalloway, as well as Gareth, Aldo, and Horia from Navabi. Steve, I'll pass it off to you. Hello, friends of Herbie. You know, Herbie, the Boy Scout uh, of the goal of Goldrat, which we always use to illustrate this story, well, the, 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 the constraints management part. Well, Herbie was never alone. He was part of a troop. So we thought tonight we'll bring in a whole troop of people, Gareth, Aldo, and Horia. And when you walk in a, in a line, there is always someone who's leading. So we'll be talking about leadership as well. Is that right, Al? That's right. So I'm Al uh, with the PMI, and I'm really excited to hear what Gareth, Aldo, and Horia have said. They've, they've helped me a lot with the Discipline Agile Value Stream Consultant Workshop, and here's some of the stuff they've been focusing on. So give it back to you, Joshua. We'll introduce them. Yeah, so um, Gareth, Aldo, Horia, why don't you lead us into today's topic? Thank you, Joshua, and thank you, Alan, Steve. Yes, the three of us today are going to talk about what we have been focusing on in the last few years at Navavi. So Navavi is based in New Zealand and is Latin for I will renew myself. There's three major parts we'd like to talk about today, and that is focused leadership, focused renewal, and adaptive governance. They all kind of intertwine, and there's something that we're all equally interested in. Um, but to talk about the first thing is focused leadership. We believe that the core of all change, whether it be organizational change or personal change, requires leadership and it requires a certain type of leadership. So we've been working and partnering with David Marquet on intent based leadership and we'll be talking, hopefully asking a few, few questions related to that later on. Leadership is how people think differently and we need to change our behavior so we act our way to new thinking, we can't think our way to new action. So for that it requires deliberate practice and dis discipline as well. The next thing is focus renewal and for that Horia I'll hand over to you. Right. Well, to support our work in focus leadership, um, we really help organizations by serving as catalysts for high performance teams. We uh, help these teams to get stronger, get better every day. And we draw inspiration from various domains and methods and practices to achieve that. And to enable teams to do really well, we found a need to balance various elements of adaptive governance. Aldo, tell us more about that. Um, thank you. Uh, and that is basically w when we f when we deal with customers, we find in adaptive governance, there's usually or there has traditionally been friction between governance, uh, governance function and these uh, this new fangled thing called agility, which is not so new fangled anymore. But there's usually friction there. And we also noticed that uh, many of the traditional governance models um, haven't really kept pace with the uh, uh, agility uh, invention and that leads to the friction so there's still an old versus the new type dynamic there and uh, on top of that is we also saw that each organization or each context um, has its own different tensions and we'll explore some of that a little bit later so we, uh, as Nuvavi, we mix leadership, the renewal, the focus renewal and the adaptive governance into, uh, into a unique solution for each of the customers that we deal with. Back to you guys. So I've got a, a question then on uh, the, the uh, Marquette part of this. Can you, can you, expand a little bit more on that for for those that might not have um heard that as, as gareth introduced it yeah so david marquet is the author of turn the ship around and leadership is language and he he's he's founded the intent-based leadership in, in international um and, and we've been working with him for well over a year now uh, the historian turn the ship around is about the uss santa fe so he was a, a captain of the submarine. Uh, he had spent a year learning uh, to become the captain of the USS Olympia. So he knew that boat inside out. 
But at the very last moment, he was uh, instructed to become captain of the Santa Fe, which he had less knowledge about. And he learned quite rapidly that being a leader who doesn't know everything is a dangerous situation to be in. So he changed the culture of the Santa Fe to one of uh, intent-based leadership rather than permission-based leadership. And his book talks about language and, and the unconscious things that we say as leaders and how it may Im influence an organization so people are avoiding errors rather than trying to achieve excellence. Um, it, it's for, for broadly based on in mission command leadership, which goes back all the way to Napoleon and Nelson a few hundred years ago. So it's not new, um, but it's been pioneered and it's a contrast from scientific management and command and control uh, management, which was, of course, Frederick Taylor and Henry Ford. Um, but recently we found that efficiencies achieved in scientific management may be offset by the benefits of intent-based leadership. So based on that, so I've got a question for everybody here. So what, what roles do, does leadership play in organizational change? Uh, I'd be interested. So Al, I'll start with you. What, what's your thinking on that? Well, to me, a lot of the role, uh, you know, making a distinction between leadership and management is is leadership has to kind of set some of the values, um, has to set some of what's OK and what's not OK. Um, you know, we talk about leadership as vision, and I think that is a key piece, but I don't think that's what's really missing in a lot of organizations. It's rather, you know, how do we go from the culture? What, what do you do when the culture isn't? effective and i am a believer in david mann's uh postulate he wrote a book called uh creating a lean culture that culture is a reflection of the management methods that are present that you react to that uh, but how do you get that to change i think is actually leadership's role to create the umbrella for management to do a good job to create good management methods okay yeah i'll um I'll give uh, a little of what I think as well is, um, you know, on, on their part, they need to do some of the learning, right? So as you described, oh, and, uh, by the way, if you want a condensed version maybe of the book, there is a great RSA animation style YouTube video um, that, that he did that kind of talked about it and it was uh, uh, pretty pretty well done. But yeah, I mean, leadership needs to, to understand what the organizational change is bringing and what it's going to take to do it, but they they need to provide the environment for the doers of the work to to get the experience that ultimately will help to to reshape the the, the culture. So that's that's something that um, I think they're quite responsible for. And, and Steve, if you go next, I'll also ask you to maybe you're probably pondering command and control. Uh, you know, that's that's something I, uh, I always uh, sort of react to because I, I have my theories on what uh, creates this uh, the, the perception of command and control. Um, and also I, uh, I object to um, to the critique of uh, Winston Taylor and scientific management uh, because it's being clearly broadly misunderstood and misrepresented. Uh, he, uh, he was purporting a, a very much more collaborative uh, relationship between the workers and the, and the let's say, the, the, the owners than uh, what is being uh, re recounted. And uh, here I want to refer to the excellent uh, works of uh, Professor Bob Emiliani, who's been digging into the historical papers of that time. And if you read them, the, the sense is that, well, Taylor, he was agile way before agility was, uh, was a thing. So that's, that's something that, uh, that is uh, uh, no widespread in the industry. And I think it really needs to be pointed out and, uh, and corrected. Uh, now to the, to the command and control part, uh, you mentioned permission-based leadership. Yes, we have that phenomenon that, that uh, in many, most places actually, unless, uh, unless you're given permission, you, uh, uh, you, you are like the, the deer in the headlight and you're paralyzed. You don't know what, what to do because you might upset the, the, uh, the powers that, um, that be. And yes, uh, the intent-based leadership has like origins in the, uh, in the military world, as you mentioned, uh, Napoleon Moltke and, and so on. But I think it's uh, 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 
nowadays in knowledge work this element of uh, intent-based uh, leadership um, becomes a necessity no longer an option why well because at the times of uh, napoleon and moltke i mean napoleon could probably draw out a sword and give a good fight to anyone he knew how to do the job um, and of course he raised in the ranks and, and became the, the the general the commander in in chief nowadays when we talk about knowledge work by definition the workers know more than uh, than the uh, the commanders the leaders so there is this loss of uh, of skills and knowledge and competencies on part of the leader the leader is forced to trust the knowledge workers it cannot be otherwise otherwise it would not be knowledge work and in that situation the leader can only like indicate the direction indicate the desired results and the desired outcomes and trust that the workers will actually do that so i strongly believe that in any successful uh, knowledge work organization uh, there is some sort of intent based leadership in action even though it might not be so uh, explicitly uh, like put in place deliberately put in place place as if you uh, like do it systematically and uh, with a method which i understand uh, 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 you three friends of Herbie are doing. And, and I've got a I've got a question for for the three of you on this. So I have not read the book, but I did again watch the the YouTube video. What was what was uh, the outcome of the learnings on the San of Hay? Did other you know did did that go to other ships? Did that go to other submarines or or you know ships within uh, the the fleet? It, it did, yes. Yeah. So when, when Marquet took over command of the Santa Fe, it was the worst performing ship in the fleet. And within a year when they did the fleet review, uh, which, which happens on a regular basis before they deploy, it became the best performing uh, ship of all time, not just in the Pacific or just um, in, that's in the submarine fleet, it was of all time. And, and then he mapped that across. The, the retention rate of the enlisted men was, I think, three in, in the, when he first joined. And at the end, it was 30. And many of the officers ended up taking command of their own ship or being in senior positions elsewhere in the military. So okay. there was a great longevity. So it wasn't as soon as Marquet left the, the, the uh, Santa Fe, things reverted. It actually carried on, which is a good measure of level five leadership. Um, his new book, um, Leadership is Language, also talks into other instances where poor leadership and, and coercive language can cause people to uh, act defensively. And, and I think it, uh, both books are really recommended to be read. Aldo. Yes. Um, what we see is some of the tools uh, when we work with our customers, uh, some of the tools are really practical. We've uh, some of the one of the tools, the, the ladder of leadership that I have developed, um, we can see quite actively helps people to even manage up not just wait for management uh, or, or their, their leadership to, to make a decision. They actually use, use the language that uh, the ladder of leadership um, uh, explains in order to manage up and become a little bit more proactive on a daily basis. So that, that's one instance that, that, that we see it's pretty useful. Um, it also frees people up to actually, uh, um, it, it, it motivates them a little bit more rather than to wait for an answer by being proactive and having that autonomy. Um, it, it's really uh, beautiful to see how they actually go out and use, use the tools in their uh, context. Boreal. Yeah, um, one of the things that um, is really useful in this context of intent-based leadership is remember that you have to act your way to new thinking. You can't just think about things and think about things and think about things and hope for something better. You got to do something. So act your way to new thinking. You prove to yourself, hey, this works. And your thinking changes and you get better. And um, another one is... Um, understand the importance of balancing clarity with competence and control. In other words, to be able to 
delegate more control, you got to be confident that people have enough clarity on why is it that we're doing this and what is it that we were supposed to do. And you got to trust that people have the competence to actually achieve it well. And if they don't, well, you need to mentor them, you need to teach them, you need to coach them to help them actually do well. So once you do that and people have the ability, they rejoice in doing things really well. And therefore, hey, you can detach, you can allow more delegated control and you can then progressively just share intent and enable people to execute their own freedom to um, apply their skills however they best um, can. Back to you, Joshua. Yeah, um, I just popped something uh, into the chat um, that Al wanted to put out there, right? Uh, a quote by Miller Fuller. So, um, Al, did you want to expand on that at all? I know that's a, I recognize the quote from the DAVSC course, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's easier. Miller Fuller said it's easier to act yourself into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way yourself into a new way of acting. And I think that just reflects what he was saying. Actually, I want to I want to actually say something else because it's kind of interesting. So when I read Turning the Ship Around, it really had a big impact on me. I'll be candid. At that prior to reading that book, I had thought everything could fit under the lean thought process. And in fact, most stuff does fit under the lean process, but intent intent-based leadership does not. That was a new expansion of leadership consistent with lean management, but not part of lean management as I knew it at the time. And there's an interesting parallel here. Marquette was very good that he created it, but he really had no choice. He was on a ship that he actually thought had different speeds. It didn't, it had one speed, there was no transmission in the ship. That's how little he knew, he was just jumped in. And the reason I bring this out is he was kind of, he looked at the situation it was in. It was untenable to be the guy who knows everything. And he was kind of forced into the situation of accepting he needed his team and his team knew more than he did. Now, this is actually a interesting confluence of history. Lean also, if you look at how did the Toyota production system come out? It wasn't just that these smart people figured it out. They were put in a situation after World War II. Yes, they had some knowledge. They had been seeing just in time and some other things, but they were in a situation where they had to do small batches. They had people, too few people, but enough equipment, more than enough equipment for people. They were kind of forced into creating TPS in some ways. The reason I bring this up, I just find it's interesting that both these methods, breakthrough methods, were created because you had this confluence of I, the current method, the current thinking didn't work, and they came up with something that did. And I commend them for it, but I actually, I just finished reading this book called The Obstacle is the Way. It's really about stoicism. And it's not that the, and thank you guys, I got there because he y'all. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, yeah, so I finished it anyway. But what's interesting is it's not what makes me, what, what, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. It's not like, oh, if I overcome, you know, it's not no pain, no gain kind of thing. It's rather, that's the point. That's where you have to look. That's where the answer is. It's not in the overcoming of it. It's in the focusing of it and learning of it. And in all too many organizations, we use the uncertainty of management, the uncertainty of leadership as a way to avoid the real issues. We look at, we don't understand as well, we better not go there. You know, like I think we shy away in complexity from that. So I think one of the lessons with, with David's work, which I really recommend both of his books, brilliant, is that you take the challenge that's coming at you head on, you don't work around it, rather it's a symptom of something deeper that you have to fix. And I think that's an attitude we need as well in leadership. Okay, and with that, uh, I'd like us to talk about focus renewal. Um, so Horia, take us away. Right, um, what we mean by focus renewal in Novavi is this idea, the practice of helping organizations get really strong, get really effective. And that requires high performance teams. Now, a foundational step in establishing high performance teams is what we call a chartering experience. In other words, developing really great clarity of purpose, vision, mission, mission tests for the team, then helping with clarity of alignment, uh, who we are as a core team, what are our values and principles, what's our market of skills, what can we rely on each other 
uh, for, and what's our agreed way of work? Uh, what is uh, some kind of social contract and an agreed way of work? And finally, clarity of context. Um, what are our boundaries? What are our community interactions? What are the uh, other people and assets that we can rely on? And finally, some form of perspective analysis on dependencies, issues, assumptions, risks, constraints, and maybe agree on some form of decision register. So having a discipline to cover all of these uh, things is really um, an essential foundational uh, step. And in addition to that, we recognize the need for really excellent facilitation and coaching. And therefore, we um, inspire people to embrace facilitation and coaching, and we teach, mentor, coach people to do a really great job in this space and therefore serve as catalysts for um, developing really strong teams that improve through Kaizen, Kai Kaku, and uh, Kakushin as appropriate. Uh, Aldo, any other thoughts? Um the other thing that we do here is as well, we don't just give them one single tool to rule all of it. Um, we, we explore uh, a wide range of methods, practices, techniques, frameworks, and methodologies. Um, with them, <clears throat> we scan the environment, and the DA um, uh, toolkit is really useful to help us um, scan that in a more focused way in order to find what could potentially work. Uh, better in their given context and what are the other options that they may have if their context changes. Um, so that's uh, that that's pretty useful. But we continuously try and add um, new uh, new skills, techniques, methods, practices and frameworks uh, to uh, to our uh, own um, tool bag or toolkit um, because there isn't um, to quote uh, Lord of the Rings, there isn't one ring to rule them all. Um, you can't, um, we've seen too many instances of people that just have a hammer and then everything looks like a nail. Um, and that doesn't really work. Um, what you apply in the social sector doesn't necessarily work in the military or it doesn't necessarily work in uh, a, a private organization um, that sells uh, medical equipment. So um, it, the, the context is really, really important for us there. And that helps us with exploring in order to um, uh, focus on the uh, 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 focus renewal. Um, it's that exploration of continuously finding better ways. Um, yeah, Kairos. Yeah, and I'd just like to pick up again on what Hori had mentioned about chartering. Um, for me and for all three of us, this is really important. So many organizations we've been to, uh, especially the larger ones, see project chartering as something that is a nice to have. Team chartering is something that uh, we can do away with. Um, there's a belief that in agility or in agile, we just get going. Um, but we understand and we believe that if we create a shared understanding and a shared belief in the, in the, in the vision, and then at the strategy level, it's going to make it much easier for people to make rapid tactical decisions. We know that it's delays in decisions, decision latency that can cause delay in projects. And so we really focus on that. And we're inspired by the book Liftoff by Ainsley Nice and Diana Larson. And from that, we uh, help teams understand what it is, what the initiative is that they're embarking on. Or even if it's a BAU team, it's not a project, it's a flow based effort that we still do some chartering to align the team and have a, a, a shared understanding. So in the um, the team chartering, is the, the focus really just on the team or is it on the team and then the team's working, I don't know, within a value stream and then that value stream working within a value network? Is it is it expanded upon or is it more and more focused on, on just the, the team and be having a team being high performing? Right. Now, as it's all about the whole system. So this works at um, progressive levels of um, um, sort of hierarchy or network uh, connection. So chartering doesn't apply to just one small team and that's it. No, it has to go across the value stream. You're absolutely right. I think there's a question in here from Enrique for you, Horia. 
Um, let me see. A uh, question from Enrique. If you just, if you just look on the screen, it's on right. the screen. Right. Um, when you say um, clarity makes me think about awareness-based leadership. Um, well, um, awareness is essentially the, the critical aspect. Um, you have to go see what is actually going on. You have to notice. You have to be curious. You have to be humble and figure out. And that's where the ladder of leadership essentially starts. It says, rather than I'm the boss, I will tell you what to do. It says, oh, hold on a second. First, what do you see? Um, what are you thinking? What would you like to do? What do you intend to do? That's in essence what the ladder of leadership is all about. So yes, it is about building awareness. That's that's the name of the game. Back to you, Joshua. Well, one of the other questions that I've been thinking about um, is, so on the Santa Fe, right, which is a lot of this was originally based off of, um, and, and I don't know what type of movement there were between um, the, the enlisted and, and the officers, but if they were learning this in, intent-based approach to leadership and they you know, move from one ship to another, was was any of that captured either in in either of the books that have been mentioned or any of the the stories that you know somebody coming from that type of an environment that was probably quite exciting um, to back to what it might have been um, on every other um, ship in the fleet at the time? Any challenges? Any 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 stories of of that? Yeah, the and let me add, I'm sorry, let me add one. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, you have teams that maybe have started off and, and, and maybe they were the pilot, the early adopters, whatever, in an organization taking an agile way of working, and, you know, and, and and they see how much different it is and, and, and better. And then, you know, they, they, they move back around and they're on a team that maybe is using a more traditional approach. So um, that, that was the impetus of the question. Yeah, there's, there's one story that springs out for me. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm ex-Royal Navy and on an anti-submarine warfare frigate as well. So I'm, I'm very familiar with some of the things that happen in submarine warfare. And the most important thing is noise because sonar is uh, audio. And, and if you can pick up noise, then you can find out where the target is. And so what would happen on board a, a ship or a submarine, if there was suddenly the sonar operators were picking up internal noise, they would have to file a report and find out where that noise was coming from. And it may take some time. And during that time, you could be detected. What they shifted in the Santa Fe was if you were changing a, a lever or opening a filter and it, and it caused some noise, you would immediately report to the control room that, hold on, this was me. Uh, I've now resolved it. And because of that, it found that errors were resolved mo much more quickly. Because if in the first instance, if you've made a noise, you think, oh, I better keep that under wraps because otherwise I'll be in trouble. Instead, if you make an, make an error, you report it straight away. It can be resolved much more rapidly. And this is not dissimilar from uh, pulling the and on cord or the way the Toyota production system works. It's everybody is involved in the quality from the entire valley stream. And so if you do discover a, an issue, you, you flag it straight away. And that actually changed um, the noise profile of the whole ship that it became the quietest ship in the fleet. Hmm. Yeah, and then um, one really interesting thing is the, the book itself, uh, Turn the Ship Around, is a story of struggle. It's not a story, oh, oh yeah, one day we woke up and hey, everything was fine. No, <laughs> it's a story of overcoming difficulty and resistance and people that kicking and screaming didn't quite want to, but see, the thing is, on a submarine, you're in a can, under pressure, in the middle of the ocean, and everything wants to kill you. So you got to adapt or die, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that was a, a really important element, a pressure cooker that, that, that made this possible to, to kind of erupt almost into, into an effective way. And leadership is the essential defining factor. And the thing is, um, intent-based leadership isn't the only story coming out of a Navy um, to, uh, to do this. Uh, you can look at uh, Abrashov and his uh, It's Your Ship. Very similar, but with the surface ship. You can look at Jocko Willink and his extreme ownership. Uh, also, um, ex-officer um, in the Navy SEALs, right? Um, his operations mostly uh, were in uh, Iraq, the most uh, powerful ones. But again, similar notions of uh, decentralized command, uh, detachment, simplicity, belief. 
um, it's it's all in the same general vein. You got to connect really well with people. Yeah, I think I mean it, it seems like we're we're referring to books, but we've actually put this in practice. We have a few clients in New Zealand who have experienced uh, a program of being self-aware of how language and how the intent-based leadership can be applied. Um, Aldo, I'll see you nodding there because you've worked with quite a few Wellington clients, so maybe you could share a story there. You're on mute. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yep. mute. Unmute, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that own goals. Anyway, um, I was uh, more thinking about the Aussie customer we're currently helping in Australia um, about um, just having that awareness of the the, the way that we um, that, that that we talk and even how we ask questions um, has made a huge difference in in the way that they conduct their um, the contact sessions with each other as well as uh, any dialogue that they engage with with people reporting to them and people they report to. Um, we ran a similar um, a series of uh, awareness workshops with uh, uh, New Zealand police uh, earlier this year. And uh, it's amazing what just that awareness of the way we use our language, it's amazing to see what it actually uh, brings and how it changes the dynamics of, of the relationships um, between a really strict command and control culture it really changes so it's it's amazing to to observe that hmm. Al, i think you had uh, something to add to this yeah i i'm just listening to you <laughs> and something really hit me your message is so much more important than with leadership and let me explain so in the agile community i mean part of intent-based leadership is what are the objectives and push the response down to the people who are working. But it's not just delegation. It's understanding what it takes to get the job done. It's really, that's what's really great. In other words, you're not just saying I'm gonna delegate, you're asking how can they make good decisions? So a leader enables people to make good decisions, not just create safety, but give them the information they need so they can make the decision and then can, you know, you get to check to see if they made a decision. So you're actually having them be responsible at a higher level than they may be operating at. They say, well, I intend to do this. But since they're not at that level yet, I intend to do this. And you say, yeah, go ahead. So they, in their mind, make the decision. So they're actually acting. Like you said, you have to act your way into it. So it creates this opportunity and it creates a way of doing it. And I hear so many people in the agile community that say this is a good thing. We have to delegate. We have to create this opportunity. But where is this demonstrated in Agile Methods? Sorry, I'm on a little rant here. This is one of my big things, is that virtually every framework out there tells you what to do. And by the way, DA is not a framework, and Tameflow is not a framework, OK? Um, but virtually every framework out there tells you what to do without telling you what the objective is. And it flies, that flies in the face of turn the, the ship around. Yeah, the why, why is missing. missing. Exactly. So so we need to this hypocrisy. I just got how hypocrisy, how hypocritical it is <laughs> that we say, oh, yeah, leaders need to create this. Leaders need to give us the why. Leaders need to create the thing. And then our own frameworks. Well, not mine, not Steve's, but the frameworks in the agile community don't follow this. So, sorry, I'll off, get off my soapbox now. I, that just hit me so strong. I, I wanted to say it. A blog Wonderful. is coming. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. How about this question? Um, which one? Uh, which one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this because I know Jimmy quite well. Uh, he's ex, ex Spotify coach. I've worked with him in Stockholm a few times. Uh, thank you for dialing in, Jimmy. Um, yeah, there, there are times when command and control response of a leader is can be helpful especially if the, if the culture is so toxic that it needs some kind of assertive leadership to start off with. Uh, and I've asked this question of David himself, and he says we've got to be very careful that we, we track away from that as rapidly as possible. So th there are some times in emergency and in chaotic situations where a centralized control can help, but often it's about uh, aligning coherence, not centralizing command. So what we want is a shared awareness. Then you have many independent thinking people thinking for themselves, and then those rapid tactical decisions can happen. So yes, but with a strong caveat that in very limited scenarios. 
See, we haven't heard too much from you today. Well, I, I'm uh, I'm registering many dots that uh, that uh, I'm trying to connect in a, in a network. And um, what was that quote at the beginning? You you cannot think yourself uh, into acting, but you have, you have to... to act yourself to new thinking. It's a lot okay. easier to act yourself to new thinking than just think yourself to new action. Uh, so I think that one is very interesting. It, ha it has many, many consequences. Uh, certainly you cannot think by yourself. All, all thinking builds on something, on something previous and often a little nudge will do a lot. And uh, uh, let's go back to Goldratt and, uh, and the goal. The, the whole storyline was about this Alex Rogo, the manager who had enormous problems and he found guidance in uh, in yona what did yona do he asked questions asked questions that triggered some thinking and then that thinking triggered the uh, the actions and this is the central model i use in uh, in tameflow that i base things off thinking but what is the triggering element of course, you need to ask the right question. I know this is the, it's nothing new. It's the Socratic method. It's been around, well, no. When was Socrates? 2004, 500 years ago. So so it's quite quite uh, reliable, well-tested met method. It's hard to do, yes. So you need the right question to, to begin with. Uh, that is necessary, but it's it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. That will not trigger the action. Uh, what is missing is an element of self-interest. I would even say selfish interest. And I work a lot, uh, a lot with uh, with that to create the conditions where, by triggering the right, by asking the right questions, you are triggering actions that are powered by the self-interest. Uh, and I say it's the enlightened self-interest, but not in the sense of hallelujah, no, I, I get the, the, the divine enlightenment. It's more the enlightenment of, of, of uh, Archimedes. You know, it's the eureka, the, the light bulb in, uh, in the cartoon that you, you get a deep insight and all of a sudden your perspective on the world changes. And in that changing perspective, you make different decisions and those decisions will lead to different actions. So I think that thinking uh, has a very, very strong component in, uh, in all sorts of, uh, of change. Now, going back to some other points, uh, which I uh, think are extremely important, I talk about the unity of purpose. The, the company has to have a, a purpose and everyone has to stand behind that. How do you get them to stand behind? Again, with enlightened self-interest. And how do you get that? Well, by sharing mental models, by sharing ways, uh, ways of thinking. Now I know TameFlow is probably very brainy, so people prefer not to think. It's easier to, to follow a, a guide to the letter and, uh, and uh, delegate the thinking to someone else. But if you start applying these like first principles and uh, ask questions as a leader, you have a very powerful tool because you can very quickly get to the, well, let's say the results, the outcome of one important things you guys said, the chartering, now getting all on the same page. Uh, if you trigger the self-interest of all the people in the same direction, they will get to that same page on their own accord. They, they will self-propel to that same page. And then you have that, you have the unit of purpose, you have the possibility to de delegate because they will be thinking and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, Steve, it's not just only asking the right questions, but asking those questions in the right way uh, as well. Um, we find that many, many people um, ask questions that just closes down conversations instead of inviting further exploration. Um, so that, that, that awareness of how we use language is, is quite key in order to uh, unleash what you've just uh, explained. Well, uh, absolutely, but that's uh, that's the essence of uh, of the Socratic method. The right question implies 
also the right uh, uh, how can we say the the, the right uh, format and the uh, the right expression. So I no, I totally agree with that. But I think it's implicit uh, in in uh, Socratic method. Yeah, I, I think one thing that hits me when you say what you're saying, Steve. I love hearing you talk because you you are so out of the box so often. I got okay. He's probably what he's saying probably is true, but it hasn't penetrated my brain yet, uh, <laughs> which is good. Then I have to think about it. So I think one of the things that's so wonderful about intent-based leadership is it actually blends action and questions, action and theory together inherently in it. So it's, it's this, yes, we have to ask the right questions. Yes, we have to have the proper theory and thinking. But by saying what the intent is, by asking, well, what's my intention? How do I manage that? You're actually getting both in that same question. And I think that's powerful. I haven't thought about this enough. But it, it's a guide, I think, for better questions as well, because I have this result. So I understand why. And I understand why, because like you say, if you're trying to get rid of noise on a submarine, well, it's kind of obvious why, but it's nice that it's stated. And then how do I do that? It's that intermarrying of basically theory and practice. Um, in fact, I, there's a great quote by Deming uh, that's all about that. He's saying how without theory, in fact, here, let me catch it right here. Um, another paraphrase of his, a, a paraphrase I made, that, but it's not this quote here, is uh, theory by itself or uh, uh, theory by itself is, is uh, useless. Uh, practice without theory or theory without practice is useless. Practice without theory is expensive. Um, but I also like this quote. I just put that, uh, Joshua, if you can expand and then I'll, I'll stand down now. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to say one other thing. So I would like these three people to talk more about how this attitude has helped you with your clients. You're being way too polite, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, and and I would I would like you to give a little bit asserting yourself because let me just give you a little bit. Uh, these guys are phenomenally smart. OK. And um, uh it's and they're very pragmatic so they're not just these eggheads somewhere who know stuff they know stuff and they know how to do stuff so i'd like to hear them express themselves a little bit more about how they do stuff how they work with people because i think more people should be using them yeah, yeah. And i'll pile on top of what al just said because i know Hori, you were you were answering some of this or putting some comments in but yeah so expand on on maybe a little bit as well what what you've actually done with some of these organizations that you're 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 truly helping um versus again just just handing out a a you know a stack of books all right i'd like uh, to invite gareth to start us off on this one yeah and um and just hearing what uh, john carter that comment he, he just wrote um yeah that's a problem and uh, I, I'm very self-aware as well that be, between the three of us we get through well over 100 books a year and and so often I can just suddenly say, I've been reading this morning uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Blink and, and I'll try and apply it as soon as I can. The problem is, is that that can sometimes confront people and say, well, it's all good in theory. So what I try and do is look for those micro behaviors and demonstrate how the theory may work in that context. So and this is the uh, think, act your way to new thinking. It's not dissimilar from how Mike Rother talks of Toyota Kata is it's, there has to be a practice. And so what we do as coaches is encourage those practices in a teaching kata. So we say, try this, see how it happens. Now, the reason this happens is because of this theory, and this is where we learned it. Um, but sometimes I'm very cautious of being playing, reading the book too much. Uh, it has to be the action. And that's why we're in-person coaches. We talk people through, but they have to feel safe that it's okay to try things new, to, to experiment. And as with every Socratic uh, mm -hmm. hypothesis or uh, experiment we run, you need to have the theory to build the hypothesis and then test that hypothesis. And I think often people fail to do that, especially in Agile. The use, the use of the word experiment is quite prolific uh, and one I try and avoid. How are you? Um, yeah, the most important thing is connection. It's all about uh, building strong relationships with people. 
because without it, um, I can't really influence you. And if I don't allow myself to be influenced by you, we're not going to get anywhere. So the essential foundation here is learn how to appreciate people for who they are. Learn to empathize with people. Start by understanding why is it that people behave in the way that they do. And that comes back to uh, ancient wisdom from people like Sun Tzu and Miyamoto Musashi. Um, you got to know yourself and you got to know your opponent as well. And then in that way, you help people to become better and you win the enemy country as a whole without shedding one drop of blood. Uh, all of a sudden, you show that, hey, this other different, better way is way more uh, uh, essential. In other words, you don't attack um, the opponent head on and say, that's wrong. You engage in a flanking maneuver of some sort and you achieve results, uh, although it may seem a little bit slower, uh, as they say in the military, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And um, that's the general way. idea. You're defining the obstacle as a way there as well. Pretty and much. It's, pretty it's, much. A it's a cognitive obstacle. O often people feel um, like a, a, a cognitive uh, disassociation with this new idea because it's threatening. So we need to yeah. build that safe, safety into it. Yeah. And that's the critical distinction between manipulation and true leadership. Um, I, if I'm doing this for myself, I want to be a leader. And uh, guys, if you don't do this, I'm not getting my bonus. So therefore, I'm going to push the hell out of you so you make the numbers and I get my bonus. Mm, well, then you're not really a leader. You're a tin pot dictator, basically. To be truly a leader, you have to support a mission that is meaningful and beneficial to us all and therefore we can trust one another and we can help one another and we can actually get energized about achieving that mission aldo what do you think in this space get off of mute mate i've been thinking about the work we've been doing um, with adaptive governance uh, within organizations and the only way to actually break the um the us versus them mentality is through dialogue um we we for instance we talk about how much trust are you willing to uh extend to the team um in but still re retain um what's the minimum level of control that you still want to con uh, 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 retain when when we talk about the governance and through dialogue, um, we've got a, 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 set, a few sets of tools that we use in that dialogue. Um, we get to actually look at both sides and that exploration that they find um, uh, th through that exploration, they actually get to understand both sides. And that's how we get to a win-win. So, um, uh, and then we create a new vision and a new charter. Uh, then we engage with the chartering directly on that once we understand both sides, or it can be part of the chartering process. Um, I'm curious as to um, uh, when we talk about that type of balancing, um, this is a question to Alan Steve, is to ask you guys, um, in, in, in your in your travels out uh, out into the world there, um, what have you found um, in terms of balancing safety to try new things um, and versus safety to keep the to, to keep to keep us steady to keep the ship steady? Um, what have you found uh, in there? Because there's a tension in there. It says, uh, "Oh, we can't change too much because of these and that," or "This is the way we've always done this." Um, versus safety to explore, safety to um, experiment. What have you guys found? Well, for me, it actually is related to just what is the real cause of massive waste in any kind of development. We hear a lot about complexity, but to me, the real problem is nonlinear events. Some little thing happens and then some big impact happens. A great example of a nonlinear event, of course, the camel, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, or man, if that iceberg had been just a few feet the other way. Uh, but if you look at, I read this book, The Meltdown, and he talks about Three Mile Island, and it was very interesting that what caused the Three Mile Island disaster was due to a couple of minor errors where you did not see what was going on, 
And one thing was coupled to something else. And before you knew it, you had almost a meltdown. I would suggest that the real problem we have, and I'm going to get to relating your question in a second, is three things are necessary. We don't see what's happening. Things are coupled and some small event turns into a big one. And complexity does play a role because it sometimes hides certain relationships. See, to make things safe, you have to have feedback. Feedback will stop a potentially nonlinear event to becoming a big thing. So it's not, to me, also just about writing experiments. You often have an idea. It's about not believing your own logic, that there is a theory, have a theory. Theory is good, but always validate it, always verify it. And that, that would be how you create safety in trying things. Steve? Um, well, let's say we want to create a very high performing organization. Of course, leadership is, uh, is clearly important. But if you uh, are able to instill the sense of unity of purpose, not purpose, not give a purpose, the unity of purpose or the energy behind the purpose, um, you will gain several effects. One of which is that leadership uh, becomes more of uh, an activity, not something that is uh, for the, well, privilege of some, some individual. It becomes more an activity that the most competent, remember we are in knowledge work here, so that the most competent uh, person in context can step up to and, uh, and show, uh, show the direction, show the way, uh, take on the patron role. Now, if you are in that sort of uh, environment, Bob Marshall would say it's a fellowship, then, uh, then uh, uh, safety is a result issue because all folks are in principle on an equal footing this goes back to lean's respect for people it goes also to uh, the third uh, pillar of uh, of uh, goldrat you had like inherent simplicity but another one was inherent goodness you believe you assume that people are good rather than bad and uh, in that kind of mindset, mind frame, um, people will not hold back their ideas. The, the safety, the, the fear, or the need for safety means there is some fear. If you take away the fear, you will have an avalanche of ideas and contributions and the collective intelligence of all folks will, will become like combinatorial explosive and the brain power of the organization will become just so much um, powerful. So I think that leadership is uh, extremely important, but if you get to the point where the, uh, the source of the, the energy behind all decisions and actions is the unit of purpose, well, at that point, leadership has like a second a secondary role. It's, uh, it becomes contextual. It's whoever knows what is best will, uh, will, uh, will make the call. Um, yeah, interestingly, in, in David's second book, uh, Leadership is Language, he, he uses the case study of the Alfaro, where they made a, a life or death decision of which way to uh, transit past the Bahamas on the way to Puerto Rico from Florida uh, when, when a hurricane was coming through. And it turned out that many of the crew had misgivings of going the, uh, the windward side rather than the leeward side out of the wind. Um, but the language of the coercive style of language of the captain was asking very binary self-affirming questions, such as we're good to go, right. And that didn't really open up for people to bring dissent and, and challenge the captain. And even though, the, the, and, and you could read the black box and the transcript from it, could, could clearly state that people were concerned. But because there was a rigid structure and the all-knowing captain would, would give all of the directive intent and directive uh, commands, it didn't give people an opportunity to challenge it. So one thing that book really dwells on is having that language which is uh, gives uh, gradients of response rather than uh, binary response. 
And that's yeah, that, that book ready. provides so many practical ways of creating safety. It's, it's a really remarkable book, the second one too. Yeah, and that's something we, we, we notice. So we listen in on meetings and I, I, I listen out for those binary questions. Maybe the leader's spending most of the time talking so the airtime isn't distributed equally. And, and things like they, if you hear teams say they quite a lot, it could suggest that there's a siloed thinking. So people are not thinking of the entire system. So being very meticulous about what people are saying can uncover what people are thinking. And so a lot of our coaching is, is based on what leaders say also what teams say. I know we're just about out of time as usual. And Al, I know that you had one last thing you wanted to work in um, before we close it, close it down yeah, for the day. I think, I think Marquette's uh, intent-based leadership creates something else that I think is often misunderstood in the Agile space. Yes, teams need to self-organize, but they need to self-organize within a bigger context. And that bigger context is often created, needs to be created by leadership so other people can work within it. This is an across the organization, even humanocracy, which talks about how teams are their own and little micro enterprises, micro entrepreneurs, that's been created by now the leadership that, well, that's what we are. We're creating it and move, pushing perhaps almost all the decision-making to the teams, but that structure was created by leadership. And this idea that everything is self-organizing without looking at context is a real problem because first of all, you need it. But second of all, you can often use a good context, a better context for teams to create and self-organize in a better way than they would on their own. And I've seen this doing scale. That's why I never talk about scaling agile. We do agile at scale. Create the context within which the teams can work is often a better way to get teams and an organization up. This idea that you always started a team and grow up is, is, is myth. It doesn't work, hasn't worked a lot. Every now and then it works, but mostly it's myth. How do you get teams able to self-organize while working together? We discovered this back in 2004, I think, when we tried doing Scrum of Scrums in the old way. Scrum of Scrums now is a lot different than it was in 2004. In fact, it mirrors a lot of what Guy Beaver and Jim Trott and I wrote in our book, uh, Lean Agile, um, Lean Agile Software Development Achieving Enterprise Agility, where we talked about you needed to drive from product management. And Scrum of Scrums has shifted into that. Nobody ever points and acknowledges the shift. It's not just teams, it's product driven. So this is the other thing intent-based leadership gives. I highly recommend y'all reading both of those books. They're both brilliant in different ways and they complement. And as again, I, I um, you know, I'm sure that the, uh, the folks here would love you to ask them questions and um, you know, if you've got their email and I highly recommend listening to them. I have never found them to give me bad advice and I've known them for a long time now. Thank you, Al. Yeah, it's heartfelt. You guys are great. Well, and on that, on behalf of Al, Steve and I, um, Gareth Aldo Horia, thank you very much for leading the discussion today and Thanks for everybody who uh, joined us live and for those of you who will watch us on replay and um, any follow on questions, uh, maybe we can get um, uh, one of the Navavi guys to, to give a little more context um, for Tom. Um, Tom's always asking for specific examples from our own experience. So uh, yeah, let's see if we can keep the, the thread going and uh, answer some of the questions. And remember, if you're lost, Follow the greatest leader of all. That's Herbie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.